talked about Plotinus. And I told you something of the character and disposition of this remarkable man. As I pointed out, although he lived a solitary life and had no family of his own, he was surrounded for the greater part of his life by children and young people. He was the guardian of many distinguished Roman families and through many years served very close uh, to the needs of practical people. At the same time, he was a very deep and mystical person. Perhaps one of the deepest and most profoundly mystical of all the great pagan thinkers. He had greater depth than Marcus Aurelius, a more obvious mysticism than Plato, and a greater strange internal humility than nearly any of the other Neoplatonists. Born in Egypt, he flourished principally in Rome and lived through the greater part of the third century A.D. He lived in this critical period when a great world order was gradually vanishing and he united in his own life not only the consolation that wisdom had brought to him but a beautiful and heroic attempt effort to give this consolation to others and most of his writings are burdened with his gentle acceptance of the human need and as we will try to unfold one of his shortest but best known works this evening I think you will see something of the spirit of the man perhaps we can get his spirit from his own words better than from the discussion or analysis of his character after all this time. We know that Plotinus was one of the few of these philosophers who frankly and openly admitted that he had passed through certain mystical experiences himself. Uh, the validity of his statements on these subjects is maintained by the quality of his work. There are many statements, even in this little fragment, which could scarcely come from a person who had not personally experienced something of the larger mystery of life. His essay concerning the beautiful perhaps summarizes some of the choicest of his doctrines. It is one of those small gems that sometimes fall from a brilliant pen and are remembered even after greater and deeper works are forgotten. Like Boethius on the Consolation of Philosophy and the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, the essay on the beautiful has become a classic and it is regrettable and that it is not more readily available to students today. We use for our discussion of it the Thomas Taylor translation, which was done in the opening years of the 19th century. The work is scarce, but not rare, and with time and effort can generally be discovered. The essay on the beautiful is best introduced by a study of the Neoplatonic concept of beauty. And in this study, we know that much more is implied and inferred than our common usage. The Neoplatonists in the beginning considered beauty as an alternate, alternative term to be applied with the word good. Good with a capital letter was the Neoplatonic equivalent to our word God and perhaps the word God can be traced to the same derivation, the idea of the good. Certainly we have the term, the good God. And this concept of the good 
presents deity in Neoplatonism as the object of the soul's desire. All things in themselves naturally aspire to the good. And any condition which arises by which this natural aspiration is thwarted, blocked, or retarded, results in an infirmity to the psychic life of the person. The essay on the beautiful, therefore, is very important on a psychological level. It should be given a lot of thought today when we are beginning once more to contemplate the powers resident in the human soul. Good as the object of man's eternal quest is a substance in itself beyond definition. Because we must approach good on several levels, there are things which we commonly and daily regard as good. And these, for the most part, are the gratifications of desires. When things go according to our pleasure, it is good. When they go contrary to our pleasure, it is bad. Then there are other levels of good. There are good laws, which we may grudgingly accept, yet commonly acknowledge. There are good lives, relative terms, for that which constitutes goodness of living upon one level may not upon another. There are good books, about which there can be no common agreement. Uh, there are good days in which our affairs run smoothly. Then there are good things that can happen to us. For the sick, the restoration of health. For the sad, the return of joy. For the burdened, rest and repose. Thus good, in our temporal way of consideration, means an end of a condition which is the opposite of itself. For evil to end is good, for good to end is evil. Thus we measure these things by a relative yardstick. And any improvement in our fortune is a common good as far as we are concerned. Then we have a larger concept of the common good, of working together, of building together, of sharing. We have these good things which come under the heading of virtues. We have moral good, which is virtue. We have spiritual good, which in itself is righteousness, or a state of acceptability before God and our own conscience. We have the goods bestowed by knowledge of arts and sciences. Now all these things may confuse us, as Plotinus points out. For is there a good that is apart from goodness and superior to it? Is there a principle or an eternal essence of good? And does this operate through things? And is its manifestation the source of goodness? Or is goodness merely a series of accidents arising in the mixtures and minglings of life? If there is a principle of good, if there is an eternal good, why can one person see good in a thing and another person cannot see that good? Why does the rain that brings us gratitude cause consternation and distress to those in flooded areas? Our term good, therefore, must be explored more deeply. But we must search for that kind of good which is innate in the body of God, a goodness apart from things, an essential goodness, or as Plotinus might have, called, might have called it, an intelligible goodness. The mind, contemplating upon the mysteries of life, is able to create a series of qualities which are mental goodness. Mental goodness may also search from itself toward the world around it, 
seeking for proof and evidence that other things are good. Therefore, the mind may be turned good in itself if it is a well-ordered and useful mind. But it cannot be turned good if it is an ill-ordered and useless mind. Thus again, good seems to be separate from mind, even as good is separate from those things that we call good. All good things which exist in this world are subject to alternations. Too much of good becomes itself a serpent, and we are no longer happy. Therefore also, can we say that good is associated with anything? So we come to the Neoplatonic speculation. Is good a relationship of things? Are things in a certain order good, and in another order not good? And can things of themselves not good, by order and arrangement, become good? This is a very important consideration, because if this is true, then all good is a compound. Good is something composed of parts, themselves dissimilar to their totality. This in turn leads to other speculations. And from these thinkings comes the consideration that good is not necessarily a compound. Because a thing in itself good may be composed of other things, in themselves also good. And Plotinus gives the example of a great building. And the architect, when the building is finished, looks at the whole structure and he says it is magnificent. It is correct. It is mathematically perfect. It is in law and order. It is a work of great beauty. It is symmetry. It is everything that for a building of that purpose and that kind would be good. So the building is a common good, composed of many parts. Yet this same architect, looking at a single column in this building and considering it thoughtfully and observing that its proportions are proper and symmetrical, that it fulfills exactly the purpose for which it was intended, may also rightly say that the single column is good. Therefore, good does not have to be a compound. The parts in themselves can also be good. A greater good may therefore be a combination of parts in themselves good. Therefore, good is not necessarily a compound. On the other hand, certain things, apparently worthless in themselves, such as crude and uncut stone, when worked upon and perfected by art and rendered beautiful, may become equivalent to or worthy of the term good. Yet in their rough and unconditioned states, they are not obviously good. Yet the power or possibility of goodness lies in them and is released through the work of the stonecutter. Therefore, the stonecutter bestows good and good may not necessarily be inherent. And we can continue this discussion for a long time on various levels and in various ways. Always we are seeking to determine the location of good, the fact of it, as divided from all of the secondary considerations. And it is in these thinkings and in this approach to subjects that we observe one of the magnificent facets of the mind of Plotinus. Even his most mystical, his apparently most emotional and fervent thoughts are always approached carefully, cautiously, unfolded in orderly sequence. Each reasonable doubt resolved before the mind passes to a further consideration. Never is a statement made and left unsupported or without the necessary attendant and commentary thinking. Thus we have a mystic who is also a highly ordered thinker. And yet all his thinking is used not to prove the correctness of his mind, but to prove the sublimity of the divine plan. 
And in this we have the use of mind, the use of words. And Plotinus, in one of his discussions, weeps a little over the sorrow of words. How little words can tell. How poor they are in the search for terms suitable to clear the doubts and misgivings of the human soul. And yet perhaps there is no one in antiquity who used words more lovingly, and more beautifully, and more exactly than this man, who would have been an inspiration to the best part of modern semantic thinking. And on, in his essay on the beautiful, therefore, we're just going to read a few of the opening lines to sort of set the pattern for you, and then we will go into the problem that he presents. He begins thus. Beauty, for the most part, consists in objects of sight, but it is also received through the ears by the skillful composition of words and the consonant proportions of sounds. For in every species of harmony, beauty is to be found. And if we rise from the senses into the regions of soul, we shall there perceive studies and offices, actions and habits, sciences and virtues, invested with a much larger portion of beauty. But whether there is above these a still higher beauty will appear as we advance in this investigation. That is his opening statement of the purpose of his work. And from that, we can begin to summarize the thinking of this man on a subject which is very close to us and is probably much closer as we understand what he meant by the beautiful. As a springboard for his discussion, Protanus compares the beautiful and the good because he affirms and assumes that there is a valid relation between these two terms. Valid, perhaps, first, in the fact that neither can be arbitrarily defined. This in itself is important. For that which cannot be captured in a net of definition may very likely be superior to definition, and therefore belong in a different world, a higher sphere of human contemplation. And he further held to be true <coughs> that the principle of beauty, if it has a separate and natural existence, if it is an archetype, if it is an eternal being resident in existence or in space, must be apperceived apart from its productions or those things which we call beautiful. Therefore, he recommends us to consider the possibility the things so-called beautiful are the long shadow of beauty cast upon matter, and that the beauty of physical things lies not in themselves, but is bestowed upon them by the operation of a superior power. We may go so far as to see that Plotinus is identifying the term beauty uh, with the Christian concept of grace, because beauty is a power for goodness, a power for healing, a power for health and well-being, eternally and everywhere available, and suitable to the perceptive faculties of various orders of living creatures. He then points out that for each species or genera, its own kind is beautiful. Therefore, that beauty has in its material sense a relation to acceptances, that which is strange, distant, improbable, 
or difficult of comprehension is not immediately recognized as beautiful. In art, this means that the artist, seeking to capture a concept of beauty, will find this concept changing and elusive, and that which satisfied his instincts at one period of life will not satisfy him at another period of life. The objects themselves have not changed. The energy moving through them has not changed. What then has changed? He has changed. And the secret lies in himself. When the conqueror Cambyses is said to have approached the great temple of the Olympian Zeus for the purpose of destroying the building, he entered first into the great structure and there gazed for some time upon the magnificent ivory carving of the face of Zeus, this gigantic structure, this statue, with flesh of ivory and robes of gold, seated upon its Olympian throne. And after he had gazed upon it for some time, Cabeses slowly fell to his knees, and the sword dropped from his hand, and he took an oath that he would not destroy that building or injure the god who sat there. Yet no one had spoken. Only ivory and gold had glittered before his eyes. What then had moved the conqueror? He himself said that he could not withstand the nobility of this splendid face that looked down upon him. And in this then, can we say that the Olympian Zeus was dead? or that it was merely a form? Can we say that forms of this kind, statues, paintings, and works of art, have no life in themselves? They have some kind of a radiant power, a symbolic, magical influence. For Cambyses bent to a symbol of incredible nobility, a strange, unearthly regality from the great statue by Phidias looked down and Cambyses could not withstand this strange expression. The answer somewhere, according to Plotinus, would have rested in the sublimity of the depiction. But this beauty, like a light, shone through, and yet it shone through only the works of man an inanimate substance that would soon return to the dust. Yet this beauty lived. Is this beauty then captured only in the works of men? No. Plotinus believed that it was captured most in the works of the infinite itself. That no man could equal the sublimity of the sunset or touch the grandeur of the midnight sky spangled with stars. Plotinus felt that men could not see these things, could not look upon them without being influenced in some subtle way, and recognized an incredible beauty flowing in upon them. Yet beauty is not in the stars. Beauty is not in the earth or in the air. Beauty is not even in the fire, that most incorporeal of elements, which seems itself both bodied and unembodied. Something that blazes and vanishes again. Yet every motion of it, every flicker of it, has some strange and wonderful fascination for the human mind. So beauty is none of these things. Beauty also is not corporeal, and yet the human being, the human body, the human face, the human mind, all these things may be beautiful, but they are not beauty. And yet we may rejoice in the symbols and similitudes of beauty. And Plotinus says, let us behold a handsome man or a beautiful woman, and let us say, why? Do we say this man is handsome, or this woman beautiful? And his answer was, in most probability we will say so because of the conformity of natural parts. 
we will say that the eyes are properly set. The nose is of due size. The face is well shaped. There is no violent asymmetry of parts or proportions. The whole form and structure corresponds with a norm, with that most stylish, most acceptable, most understandable by us. And when things are in their due proportions, and there is no deformity, no distortion or asymmetry in the compound, then we say that this compound is handsome or beautiful. If, however, there be disproportion, we will not say this. Yet Homer was blind, an aged and crippled man, and those who knew him called him beautiful. And Socrates, probably the homeliest of the Athenians, with his bandy legs, his a short, awkward, heavy body, his bulbous nose, his strange, bulging eyes, declared himself to be so imperfectly formed that dogs, seeing him on the street, howled and fled with their tails between their legs. Yet the disciples of Socrates called him beautiful. Therefore, beauty must have some other existence. And those who are satisfied only with proportions and dimensions and arrangements of outward parts see beauty, accept it, and hasten on their way. Others concerned with something else, some other value, may cling for a moment to the outer semblance of beauty, find it empty, and pass on to something else, wherein they find a greater beauty. They find the beauty of greatness of character, beauty of nobility of spirit, beauty of gentleness and humility of service. All these things likewise are beautiful. And as has been pointed out, there is also a strange, subtle beauty in a common ruin. We will find the broken pillars of an ancient temple or an old arch, bind with creepers, and artists will come from all over the world to paint the beauty of this wreckage. And so even these things can be beautiful, because there is a nostalgia in the human soul that rejoices also in that kind of beauty uh, which the uh, Neoplatonists call the beauty of sadness. Things do not always have to be beautiful and happy. Some, some things can be beautiful and sad. And why do these things that are sad seem beautiful to us? Usually because they release something. They cause some mellow reflection in our own lives. They revive old thoughts. They surround us with memories, some pleasant, perhaps some painful but all rich, like the involved tapestry of some ancient loom. So we find beauty also in these things. And as uh, uh, Plato pointed out, we do find the beauty of infancy in a bodily proportion which we reject in maturity. And we find the beauty of great age in those gentle, feeble, and infirm ways which we would reject in manhood. Each thing in its own season and its own time is beautiful. And the answer lies in the tree or in the shrub or in the vegetable in the garden. The tree that bears leaves is beautiful. The tree that bears fruit is beautiful. And in these different periods, the beauty of the summer foliage, the beauty of the bare lines of the tree in winter, against the whiteness of the snow. All these things are beautiful. So beauty is not summer, nor is it winter, nor is it youth, nor is it age. <clears throat> beauty is something else. And so Plotinus naturally proceeds to search more inwardly for beauty. And he comes upon the number of excellent things uh, to bring to attention. Beauty inwardly, 
extends from those most simple practices. The beauty of the mother meditating upon her newborn child. The beauty of young lovers. The beauty of strength performing works of virtue. The beauty of the man working in the field. All these things have inspired the poet, the artist, the musician to great compositions because each has recognized in some menial and common thing the <clears throat> mysterious shape of a satisfying beauty. So we go on from these to other things and Protinus takes us into what he calls the beauties of the mind. The beauties of the human thought. And he tells us and explains to us how the extension of the mind in its own inward actions may be beautiful. How the individual in the cultivation of virtue discovers a great beauty. How the artist, the musician, experiences beauty within himself long before he can confer it upon the outward world. He goes on also to explain those graces of the soul, those natural concords, that fellowship, that friendliness, that sharing of common opportunity and responsibility, these two working side by side in the cause of something that is greater than either of them. These things too are strangely, deeply, and movingly beautiful. And he also mentions the beauty of pure knowledge and beauty of reason. The beauty of that strength of mind which cutting through all sham and fallacy achieves one of the great beauties of the soul, honesty. And therefore, our philosopher gives quite a thought to the, the glory, the beauty, the sublimity of just good old-fashioned honesty. That here is an ornament, here is something that is as wonderful as a sunrise and as glorious as the moon hovering over a wonderful moonlit sea. Honesty then, integrity, stamps a beauty upon the mind. It also radiates from this its own center and is felt benevolently by the whole world or by all who come within the reach of its light and warmth. The beauty of the poet, the great dream of Homer, the wonderful theogenic vision of Hesiod, the magnificent word symbolism of Virgil, all of these things coming out bear witness to some wonderful order and dispensation in the mind. For the mind that can produce beauty must in some strange way be beautiful. Now that leads to other thoughts. Man is a compound creature with many members, dimensions, and parts. In all these he may not be beautiful, but in something he may have an excellence that is significant. Thus men may not in all things be temperate, yet they may achieve some outstanding work. But, as Plotinus points out, not in this essay, but in other works, the achievements of men by the beauty within themselves can be divided into two orders. If beauty arises in a temperament, itself imperfect, then that beauty must move outwardly and produce effects upon the physical world or upon the objective life. Thus a man who is not great in morality may clear the weeds out of a field and restore it for the harvest. A man whose life is intemperate and disordered may, like Richard Wagner, compose great music. Yet all the things which he does belong to the objective world because with without balance of temperament. Man can carve and cut and hew. He can fashion and mold and design according to the laws of the sciences with which he is informed. But these productions, the result of an imperfect knowledge of beauty, have within them the impermanence, which is the mark of this incompleteness 
and as the Oriental philosopher might say, only when man is perfect can he produce perfect beauty. And when he produces this perfect beauty, it is immortal and can never perish. But everything that is the production of imperfect or immature beauty is fragile and must have an endurance and then must vanish away. That's also in the compound of the soul. What constitutes then the evidence that beauty can be created by man and what is opposed to this concept? Man can create the beautiful because within himself resides the imagination, the internal visualization necessary for this work. But when the individual accomplishes the beautiful, is he able to explain his own accomplishment? Does he know what he has done? Is he able to distinguish the very fact or principle that transformed the thing he did into beauty? He will say yes, within a measure. This measure being canonical laws, or laws of order. The painter knows the principle of dynamic symmetry. He knows exactly, scientifically, where to center his picture. He knows that he must not center it in the center. If he does, it is dead. So by degrees, he learns also the proportions of the human body, the laws of perspective, and becomes skillful in the mingling of his colors. Thus he can explain how he has created beauty, or created that which is acceptable and is termed beautiful by those who see it. Therefore, Plotinus might ask, did you then fashion this beauty? Or did all these laws that you kept to make this thing, were they the repositories of the beautiful? It was it the law that ordained the beauty, and all you were was a servant of that law, keeping it and achieving an end, breaking it and destroying that end? Is then beauty part of law? If we keep all laws, are we beautiful? And if so, why are these laws so important? And we come to another very interesting point. Laws in nature, particularly laws in the creative arts, where beauty has its peculiar throne and where its muses dwell, these laws all work from one tremendous principle unity. The tremendous impulse of all artistic canon is to bring various elements of composition and technique into oneness. They must be brought together and lo and woe the artist whose only unity for his picture is the frame. And yet that now is too often the case. The laws of order operating in art and music must transform the single notes of a composition into a composition. They must also in art transform drawing and color and visualization, design. All these must lose their own identities in what might be termed the picture. No one will buy a picture merely of perspective, nor a picture of line, or a picture of color, although some have been talked into some of these things in these periods of modernity. But actually, we are buying not the elements of a picture, or the separate parts of it. We are buying a totality. And we are buying a totality that through its unity has become the instrument of a visualization something meaningful in some way has been produced by uniting means and agencies and allowing each to die in a compound that the compound itself might live. If the color is too strong, then the color has lived at the expense of the line. If the foreground is too heavy, the background perishes. If the lights are too bright, the shadows die. Therefore, in all things, to maintain balance, we cannot have 
the dominance of a single part over totality. All then in these laws of harmonic design, proportion, harmony, rhythm, and motion, all tell us that the purpose by which we achieve our end must be to attain unity, to take fragments and parts and fashion them into a wholeness. Now is this wholeness then, or the unity principle? <coughs> which considers all things in relations to their parts, is unity the principle of beauty. This would solve the problem of the building of the pillar, architecturally mentioned a moment ago. Because the building is a unity made up of parts, but the pillars each also is a unity, a complete pillar. And if the pillar has a pilaster at the summit of it, this can be separated from the rest and still be a complete unit, because a good palestine is a unit, it is a thing, it is a totality in itself, and several of these totalities combine to make another, and this in turn is blended with many others, each stone in a building is a unity, and in the old days of the cathedral builders each was cut lovingly and with due consideration for great artistry and ingenuity, so that when the stone was finished, a master mason placed his mark upon it, that all the ages might know that he had trued the stone. He was proud of it. So each stone was a unity, a complete work. This would follow the Pythagorean concept that all things are unities, and that unity, therefore, it can be united with others to form greater unity. In what, therefore, does a unity, being a totality of some kind, differ from what conceivably is not a unity? This brings a, a pretty important problem. Can you think of anything that is not a unity? We can say that bodies are made of cells, and therefore the body is a unity, but each cell is also. That every part of nature is therefore a part of infinite unity. This gives us a clue to something, perhaps. Is beauty, then, unity? And is it therefore present in all things, either in larger or smaller units? And as everything must be the totality of itself, is this totality, then, inevitable? And is this totality beauty. If such is the case, then beauty, archetypally, lies at the root of every existing thing which by existence has an identity. And every existing identity is a unit of beauty. Thus life, being, and beauty, and the good come into a strange and wonderful identity. Plotinus, however, is not quite certain of this point either. Because Plotinus, while he identifies platonically and neoplatonically, beauty and the good, declares that while these, as far as man's consciousness is concerned, cannot be distinguished one from another, that there is a priority in reality itself. And that, actually, the good is prior to the beautiful. Therefore, that the good may be considered to be the fountain of beauty. And the reason why the good is regarded as the fountain of beauty is that the good contains completely in itself and in abscondita the law which is beauty. In other words, Plotinus now advances the possibility that universal law emanating from the good and therefore of itself an eternal good 
flowing as from a farther fountain, produces forever and continuously restatements of itself in the process of creation. Law is essential to good. It is the witness of that which is forever rightness. For we come to one of the great arguments of Aquinas, and we must finally conclude that a thing is because it is good. And therefore, that at the root of being, the creating power inevitably decrees the good. Now the good moving into operation moves by laws conformity with it, in conformity with itself. And the motion of the good must always be the beautiful. Because the beautiful is now a dynamic. It is the firstborn of the good. Beauty, therefore, applied to the Christian concept of the Trinity would correspond to the second person. It is the Son. And as the Son bears witness to the Father, so beauty everywhere bears witness to good. Good, which is man's moral statement of oneness or the eternal. And in this same course, by the analogy to the Trinity, beauty is also the Redeemer. For that which is created by law is perfected by beauty. And all motion in nature, according to law, is beautiful. And contrary to law, is not beautiful. In order to go further, we must go a little aside into other works of Plotinus to decide, decide why something cannot be beautiful, or is not beautiful. Plotinus, following Plato and the other Greeks, declared that man, like Narcissus, gazing downward from a state of spiritual security, beheld form, body, its own reflection in a pool, fell in and drowned trying to embrace its own shadow. Man descending into the obscuration of matter, taking upon himself form or body, is inwardly obscured and outwardly caused to hesitate. His inner impulses do not come through the body easily or rapidly. As you often hear the story of the musician with his famous trombone, he blew it in so sweet and it came out so sour. The individual lacking the ability to express or reveal the beauty within himself <coughs> makes partial and imperfect expressions. Also, he is inwardly obscured in knowledge, in understanding, and in spirituality. Therefore, under the weight of this obscuration, he falls upon evil ways and evil times and therefore is capable of action contrary to law, and thus brings himself under the retribution of law. So that asymmetry or deformity or lack of beauty is in some way the result of the obscuration of the natural motion of law and life. In this sense then, to return to our other thinking, that which is not so beautiful may exist. And by the same explanation, man may describe as beautiful that which is only beautiful to him because of the obscuration of his own senses. And as each person has a different degree of this obscuration, there will inevitably be innumerable standards of acceptance and rejection on the level of beauty. That which is beautiful to the primitive human being is not satisfying to the highly sensitive human being. Thus beauty, however, has been identified as a motion, as a principle emanating from the father fountain of eternal good, and that this motion, therefore, is rhythm, is harmony, is law, and is order. All these things must then be present in the good. And here we come uh, to another important uh, step. 
Having established in our own thinking, at least in part, some skeletal outline of the theory of Photinus on the nature of the beautiful, we come early in his little writing to the question that most naturally arises. Why do we recognize beauty? How do we recognize beauty? And what makes us pause, change our mood, and become affected by the subtle symmetry of things? He says, because in each human being there is a soul. And following Plato and Pythagoras, he declares the soul. Although he only mentions it in this essay, he goes much more in detail in, his other, in many of his other works. But uh, we'll have to occasionally borrow from the other essays, and we can't note each one as we pass because it would take too much time and burden the discussion. But everything we are saying is derived from some writing of Plotinus. He explains that the soul of man, following Plato's concept, is a mathematical formula. Now this does not mean that it is merely a series of lines on some invisible sheet of paper. It is a living formula. It is an archetype. It is a magnificent geometric entirety, a unity, like some strange, perfectly formed snow crystal. The soul may therefore be mathematically defined, analyzed and will be proved upon analysis to be of its own substance and nature, balanced and equal in all its parts, having no deformity or deficiency, and suffering from no privation of excellence in any of its qualities. This soul, then, is like the diamond soul of Tibetan Buddhism. It is a radiant manifestation of eternal law, a full realization or revelation of the power of the one flowing through the beautiful into the good. The soul is therefore unity. And in man it is a superior unity, the most complete unity of which he is capable of personal and immediate experience. Now Plotinus implies that as the poet says, the eyes are the windows of the soul. But he also tells us that the ears may also bring messages, and that the hand may bring reactions from touch as to shapes and textures of things. And the Chinese go so far as to say that the tongue and the taste buds uh, can bring us the most spiritual uh, enjoyment, simply because all of these reflexes of pleasantness, of law and order, of propriety and symphony, even going into the preparation of a dish of Chinese food, all these things are part of a pattern and a plan. Chinese believe a man digests his food better if the texture, the color, the flavor, the degree of temperature, and the size and shapes of the individual morsels are carefully considered. Thus, through these windows, these sensory perceptions, the soul gazing outward is forever fulfilling or seeking to fulfill its own expectancy. Let us say for a moment that you spend 20 years in the study of art, and as a result of all that very serious and conscientious endeavor, you become what might be termed sensitive to art, truly sensitive. Is it not then true that wherever you look in your daily wanderings, you will see art because you have trained yourself to see it. You have an appreciation of it. Furthermore, you will naturally decide that some things are more artistic than others. You will look at a landscape of beautiful trees against the sky, and you would say that would be perfect 
if one tree was not there. Something has broken the pattern. Therefore, if you paint that picture, you would leave that tree out. To meet the aesthetic standard of your own appreciation. Going into an art gallery, you would with greater discrimination turn inevitably to better pictures. And you would say that the simple oriental artist who would explain nothing, describe nothing, would comment on nothing, but would stand in front of the picture and simply say, it pleases me. This was because it satisfied. If then we can train one small part of the soul through discipline, to have this selectivity, and to also to gain a new and unexpected pleasure from the observance of that which fulfills its own requirement, therefore nourishes it, or sustains it, or justifies its own inward conviction of itself. Then, says Plotinus, we accept the beautiful because the soul in us being in itself beautiful, rejoices in beholding its own likeness in other things. Always, therefore, that which brings to us the feeling of beauty and the joy and the thrill, the great contentment of spirit that comes from the satisfaction given by the beautiful, all of this is merely a reflex from the soul telling us that it has found that which is like itself. In another essay, Plotinus explains in almost identical terms the meaning of love. For he says that love is that longing for completeness or for unity within the soul which is ever seeking to restore the fragments of its own nature and finds in the world someone who seems to bring more completeness to its own life. So beauty as experienced as, as giving pleasure was under the criticism of that great critique, the soul itself that which determines proportion, that which accepts only according to its own pleasure. If this soul, therefore, is awake and has been strongly cultivated, it has a greater and nobler concept of beauty, but even in its most imperfect and deprived state, some ray or fragment of it is still powerful enough to seek fulfillment. And the primitive artist finds fulfillment in the crude figure that he has carved. For him it is beautiful. But always that which is fulfillment, that upon which our own consciousness has turned with acceptances, brings to us joy, brings to us the satisfaction of beauty. As we then go further, we observe that these standards of beauty change with our maturing, so that by degrees, uh, we become more refined. But at this point in his discussion, Plotinus also draws in uh, an allegory or lines from the wanderings of Ulysses. He describes the wanderer returning to his own shores after being long away in the terrible tragedy of the Trojan War and then in those long and harrowing years of adventure in which at last shipwrecked many times, subject to the most terrible labors and exertions and deprivations, Ulysses at last comes home. And as he nears his own land, the wanderer pauses. All his life, all through these years, he has waited and dreamed of this homecoming. But as he approaches it, he does not even recognize the shore something has changed. Things are not where he thought they were. Because in all those lonely years he had built another land. He had built a mental or inner vision of his homeland that was totally ungeographical. And by degrees he had strengthened minor errors in his thinking 
And he had misplaced the cities and the houses. They were all much bigger and more beautiful in his dream than they were in reality. And as he came home, he did not know where he was. Well, finally, however, of course, he realized and was, you, uh, was waited and was united with his own waking soul, Penelope, who had been making the tapestry that is never finished. All of these legends and allegories deal with this same problem, the struggle of life to return to its own proper and natural state. Then Plotinus goes on to contemplate how man, in his own thinking, in his own living, can advance himself in beauty. And he examines beauty on the level, we might say, of order, of that golden mean which is summarized in the statement of Socrates, in all things not too much. And Plotinus comes to the conclusion that somewhere in the mystery of beauty is the factor of moderation, that in every excess things run to deformity, that the moment our thoughts, our emotions, or our actions become excessive. Something goes wrong. Excessive attitudes afflict, distort, and disease the inward perceptions of the individual. They cause him to fall under the influence of excess and therefore to create habits which destroy beauty and deform natural character. So, Plotinus turns from all extremes to find that moderation which is beauty. Moderation then uh, affirms beauty to be a kind of balance. It's like a pair of scales, both hands at the ends of the scales by their tippings destroy beauty which is suspended at the center beam. All things move around the sovereignty of the eternal sun. And the sun is the most beautiful of all forms because it is light itself. And thinking therefore of moderation, Plotinus thinks of light. And in thinking of light, he points out that light reveals beauties. Because if these things are dark, we cannot even see them. But light brings them into strange and wonderful relief. But light itself can instantly destroy beauty just as easily as it can produce it. And there is very little beauty if the light is too strong or the shadows are too deep. <coughs> it can also blaze with too much evident light upon some fragile or sensitive subject and thus deform it. For there are some things that are most beautiful in, at night under the stars and the moon and other things that are beautiful when the sun goes behind a cloud. So light plays a very important part for light is forever revealing beauty. But light itself traces strange forms in beauty. And all who have stood on the edge of the Grand Canyon at different hours of the day will know what I mean. The light alone changes every shape, and yet nothing itself is changed. Light comes from within man. Light, therefore, can strangely relief, release or conceal beauty. Light, as absolute materialistic realism, can blaze upon a thing and kill every sensitive line that it contains. Light also, shadowed, can make the new building look old. Light, clouded, can muffle the surface of the world. Light, eclipsed, can change all things into a greenish, grayish darkness. So light can make things look alive and make them appear dead according to its usage, and there is nothing that is a more wonderful sculptor or a mold or a form than light itself. If light, therefore, can by these processes change things, then light can also 
empirically. Release, reveal, conceal the beauties of things as they are. This light in man can do these things also. The light of cold reason is one kind. The light of love that can see no defect is another. The light of friendship which accepts defect and remains the friend. All these things show how the light within the individual can mold and change the subjects and substances of the world around him. This light can be likened to the mind. And things then may not be good or bad, but thinking can make them so. And the mind, therefore, can with a sweep of its own power destroy beauty, or create it, or redeem it, or reveal it, subdue it, conquer it, annihilate it. And yet the objects seen are themselves always the same. So we come to another problem. Is beauty then a light and shadow? Is beauty in some way changing like the seasons? It is, but it is in all seasons. Therefore, it is one, though ever changing. And it is therefore forever the unity of its own nature. In the ancient Greek system upon which the doctrines of Neoplatonism are built, the whole existence came out of the mysteries of an aging time the eternal power resident at the root of things, being total and absolute, the principle of principles. And from this eternal being, by the minglings of its power, came into existence ether and chaos, the creating and the created. And these whirl together, moved in vast nebulas, whirling in space, until, formally, until finally of their strivings was formed the egg of Phanes, the strange, mysterious egg with its upper hemisphere of gold and its lower hemisphere of silver. And finally the egg burst open and a great light came out and a radiant power of Phanes emerged with many heads and arms and the bodies and faces of all creatures. And this blazing protagonist brought light to the whole world. And from this light came all the orders of light and light means knowing, means the power to observe, the power to see, the power to be. And also came from this also the darkness, from which was generated those things which may be known, those things which may be seen, those things which can be the object of the power. Therefore the power and its object, like almost an Ariman, came forth out of the great egg of eternity. And therefore in man's soul also there is this power to see and there is also the ever-present shadow of the thing seen. Thus beauty now, like music, demands some other values. A magnificent work of art in music, a great orchestration, requires not only a wonderful orchestra and a composer, it requires a proper audience. It can be totally lost if the audience is unable to appreciate it. And strangely, an unappreciative audience will gradually corrupt the orchestra. They cannot function properly. Something strangely communicated means that the pattern is wrong. The situation is not right. Therefore, the harmony is not duly and completely transmitted from the composition to the audience. Thus in beauty we have this problem, not only the power of the seer, but the powers and principles of the things seen, or the things experienced inwardly and outwardly. All these are factors and elements that must go into this great search for the substance of the beautiful itself. To perhaps summarize some points that will make t take too long to, di to discuss in absolute detail, Plotinus comes to the ultimate conclusion that beauty exists apart from the beautiful. That beauty is, and that it can be bestowed. 
but that it also can be taken back, that it can be separated from and rejoined to. Not because it can ever be completely deprived, but because it is forever in itself changing. The beauty of life is taken from the dead, but the beauty of the dead remains, and it too is beautiful. The beauty of growth is taken from the mature, but maturity takes its place and is also beautiful. Yet these beauties are not the same. Therefore, they cannot merely arise within an organism. They are the adaptations of organisms to a principle. And each change in that organism reveals another aspect of something superior to itself, the principle of beauty. Thus, there are many different musical compositions may all be beautiful, but they are not the same. Therefore, beauty is not locked in any one of them, or it could not be conferred equally upon another. Nor is beauty locked in sound, nor is it locked in light. Therefore, beauty has us an existence apart from these things because it is superior to them. And it must be superior to them or it could not be diffused through them variously. If it was identical with them or co-eternal in them, it would be restricted by them. And some things could not possess it at all. Actually, there is nothing which cannot potentially possess beauty or in which the potential of beauty is not present. We may not see the beauty of the horse in the, uh, in the gangly coat, but it is there coming into manifestation. We cannot see the beauty of the oak tree in the acorn, but it is there. Therefore, beauty has a subsistence apart from forms. Second proof, it can exist where forms do not exist. Therefore, it can exist apart entirely from such symbolic shapes and shadows as we associate with form. Beauty can exist in the pure substance of idea. Idea is without shape, but it has a nature. It is therefore archetypal. An idea may be symmetrical, though without a body. An idea may be harmonious, though without a shape, form, or dimension, as far as we can recognize the same. And because beauty can exist in both the form and the formless, it must be superior to both form and formlessness. Because no thing can exist in two separate states unless in its own nature it is superior to both states. If it is not superior to both, it will be locked in one. Thus we go back to the problem of the priority of knowledge in the Pythagorean theory. Pythagoras bestowed priority upon mathematics and considered mathematics the symbol of absolute beauty. He made a triad of mathematics, astronomy, and music. But he pointed out that both astronomy and music require mathematics and that it can flow into either and must. But if you remove either astronomy or music. You do not destroy mathematics because being capable of being diffused through both other sciences or arts, it is superior. But conversely, as a proof of superiority, if you destroy mathematics, you destroy both astronomy and music with it. So that which by its destruction destroys all dependent upon it is superior to them. And that which by its destruction does not destroy that which is superior to itself in this concatenation is by this virtue inferior. Thus, any beautiful thing can be destroyed. War has shown us that. Yet beauty is indestructible, therefore it cannot be identified with these things. 
Beauty exists in every art and science, therefore it cannot be identified with these, at least not one in particular. Having a separate existence in the state of morality, it is therefore resident in the soul. But it is not morality, although morality is a reflection or a specialization of it. The sublimity of the intellect may also be a manifestation of beauty. For the perfect mind, perfectly thinking the thought of God, is supreme with you. Yet beauty is not mind. Also, beauty is not merely thought. Because if beauty was thought, it could not exist in the mindless. But it does. It exists most magnificently in a crystalline structure in a rock. Beauty is therefore superior also to mind, because mind can go and beauty remain. We know that, because beauty was here before mind came. Therefore we can have no doubt. We also have the thoughtless beauty of children, which arises from their natural instincts and not their thoughts. And we have the magnificent beauty of the flight of a bird, or the leap of a deer. Yet these things rise not from philosophy, nor morality, nor ethics, but from the instinct and nature of these creatures. Therefore beauty lies in instinct also, not in mind alone. Then we can go on beyond the mystery of mind. And we can find that the mind, deeply and gravely perturbed, cannot achieve beauty because of its own disturbance and in its extremity turns from itself to faith and there finds beauty. Therefore, in the stillness of the mind and the simple acceptance of good, we find the eternal presence of beauty. And perhaps there is nothing more beautiful than man's simple and complete acceptance of the reality of the divinity of things unseen and unknowable. Thus man, reaching toward his Creator, builds convictions, patterns, dreams within himself, some mental and some surpassing mind. Socrates, shortly before his death, thinking of the condition of the state into which he was to pass, declared that factually he had no knowledge of this state that to him it had always been an unexplored country which he longed to visit. He knew that to visit that country by drinking the hemlock, he must leave not only his body, but perhaps his mind also, certainly his physical brain. That he might, as he says, be going into an infinite sleep from which there is no awaking. Also, he might be going into this better land than he had ever known. He might be going to this world where the gods dwelt and where all the answers were to the questions that he could find no answers in his books or in his world as he knew it. And so at the end, not with great thought, but with the faith of a small child, Socrates went forth to the great adventure, completely at peace. And his disciples knew that this peace was also a kind of beauty. For there is great beauty in great peace. And peace comes usually not from the mind, but from the relaxation of the mind in the presence of something vaster than itself. The beauty of prayer comes not from thought, but from faith. Because man cannot even clearly envision in his mind the substance of that to which he prays. Yet in his faith, he finds a great peace, and this peace is order, and this order is the internal experience of law, the sense that all things are inevitably right, and the realization of this rightness is in itself an effulgent beauty within man. And so we quest onward to the beauty to that which is essentially the principle of beauty. And it vanishes, as Plotinus tells us, 
in the effulgent nature of the one, the eternal God, in whose heart and soul the roots of beauty are hidden, which man cannot in, them, in that substance or immediate apperception know. Now Plotinus was a man with uh, very practical thinking in his mind, and to him the concept of the beautiful imply man's quest of it, or the power of man to increase in beauty, to increase in his own internal apperception of this quality. Therefore, I'm just going to read a few more lines from the more mature part of this essay in which it is gradually reaching this climax of utility. But you will ask, after what manner is this beauty of the worthy soul to be perceived? It is thus. Recall your thoughts inward. And if while contemplating yourself, you do not perceive yourself beautiful, then imitate the statuary. When he desires a beautiful statue, cuts away what is superfluous, smooths and polishes what is rough, and never desists until he has given it all the beauty his art is able to effect. In this manner must you proceed, by lopping what is luxuriant, directing what is oblique, and by purgation, illustrating what is obscure, and thus you continue to polish and beautify your statue until the divine splendor of virtue shines upon you, and temperance, seated in pure and holy majesty, rises to your view. If you thus become purified, residing in yourself, and having nothing any longer to impede this unity of mind, and no further mixture to be found therein, but perceiving your whole self to be a true light, and light alone, a light which, though immense, is not measured by any magnitude, nor limited by any circumscribing figure, but is everywhere immeasurable, as being greater than every measure, and more excellent than every quality. If perceiving yourself thus improved, and trusting solely to yourself, as no longer requiring a guide, fix now steadfastly your mental view. For with the intellectual eye alone can such immense beauty be perceived. But if your eye is yet infected with any sordid concern, and not thoroughly refined, while it is on the stretch to behold this most shining spectacle, it will be immediately darkened and incapable of intuition, though someone should declare the spectacle present, which it might otherwise be able to discern. Now this point is developed gradually through the text, but on the theurgic the level, this being the seventh part of the Neoplatonic discipline, Plotinus gives us certain instructions. He says, first of all, no soul or psychic entity such as man can perceive a beauty superior to itself. And between man's inward power to perceive and the outward objects of his perception is imposed the nature of himself with its limitations its shortcomings, and most of all, its lack of discipline. Therefore, a man seeking about him to solve the mystery of the beautiful may first be satisfied only with external forms as the first rungs of a ladder leading upward to the ineffable. Outward forms by their symmetries may satisfy him because he is not yet aware of internal or eternal qualities. But as the statuary 
making his statue, must reveal beauty or release it through his own psychic light, through the truing of the stone, an allegory incidentally derived from Socrates, so the human being discovers the beauty in himself by releasing it from the deformities of imperfection. Each individual therefore becomes a sculptor and he accomplishes his end not by creating beauty but by releasing it. And the allegory is so subtle and so mysteriously true that you have to think of it twice. Uh, someone once congratulated Socrates because he had made a very beautiful statue. And he, with his usual modesty, disclaimed the credit, which he said belonged to the gods and the muses who had inspired him. Because always in this piece of marble, the statue had been there. It was always beautiful. No one could add anything to its beauty. No one really could subtract anything from that beauty except by destroying the statue. All he, Socrates, had done was to take away those parts of the stone which were not supposed to be there. And what was left was beauty. He had released. He had not created. Uh, thus, in the, in, in the perfection of the human soul, by the correction of its vices, by the moderation of its excesses, uh, by the maintenance of its temperances, man does not create beauty, he permits it to manifest according to its own nature. <clears throat> thus, man does not become beauty, he becomes beautiful because beauty is released through him by keeping the laws of its own kind. Now as Plotinus proceeds in this essay, we can understand immediately that by beauty he now means also something else. He regards beauty in its ultimate form as an apotheistic state by which man is capable of the experience of the sovereign beauty of reality. Thus the beauty now becomes the mystical experience. It becomes illumination. It becomes the state of man's at one moment with the sublime substance of total being. And he himself described that on certain occasions this beatific state had been accorded to him and that for a moment he had dwelt in a state of measureless, timeless identity with being. And that this identity was the supreme beauty, the absolute and perfect release or expression of beauty upon and through the human soul. For he beheld in that moment all things beautiful. And this was the mystical experience. Not that he should behold the secrets of all things, nor should he speak with the voice of men and of angels, nor that should he have all knowledge or all skill, or that wisdom should reveal and unfold through him all of its mysteries and its works. These are not the things that happened in those magnificent moments of the perfection of the theurgic mystery. All that Plotinus had known was infinite being in its infinite beauty. Not a sensible beauty to the mind or a corporeal beauty to the body, but a transcendent ecstasy, that magnificent, complete and total participation in the infinite satisfaction of infinite beauty. He then, as he tells us in other works, became aware of the body of God, and that that body was beauty walking alone. And he tells us also that no one shall find beauty who does not discover the magnificent, ecstatic, radiant loveliness of walking alone. 
that in some mysterious way, in aloneness, we have achieved a unity, a freedom from parts, from the concepts of divisions, from the discords and dissonances. So beauty, like the blessed Damozel, <coughs> walks alone, even as in the dawn of time, according to the story in Genesis. The Lord walked in the garden in the cool of the evening. And this experience of the imminence, the omnipresence of deity, as the exquisite expression of perfect beauty, is not merely the experience of an artist. Plotinus was not an artist, in our sense of the word. He was not a painter or a sculptor, nor was he a musician as we know. Yet all these beauties were in it also, and with the wonderful sensitivity of his soul he knew these things. But it was even a, a greater and more sublime beauty. For in it his own soul rushed forth, not in gladness, but in that absolute love, that complete and entire self-forgetfulness and rush toward the, brace, the embracing of the beloved, which is, of course, in the mystic allegory, reunion or identification with God. Thus, the soul, in itself disciplined to the apperception of truth, beheld it blazing forth from the universe. And in that instant, in that tremendous experience, the great artist, the great mystic was born. For now, the being walks forever in the beauty of the garden. And the whole world reveals its numerous and manifold manifestations of beauty. And each beauty is seen as lawful. And Plotinus describes this lawfulness of the manyness of beauty. But the soul that has found the beautiful no longer needs to say, this is beautiful, this is not beautiful. For all things are beauty coming of age. All things are this infinite magnificence, unfolding, releasing, growing, blossoming, and the bearing of its fruit. This, to Plotinus, could come only to the human being who had cultivated the noblest of beauty in himself. And this cultivation meant the gradual renunciation, step by step, of every attitude, every thought, every emotion and emotion that was not gracious, that was not kind, that was not loving, that did not in itself possess some quality of beauty more obviously revealed than in these negative and destructive modes of expression. Thus, through the cultivation of beauty, man comes to fathom the mystery of the beautiful, because all beauty leads to the beautiful, which is none of these things, but abides in the midst of them and is all of them. Thus, by degrees, Plotinus tells us that religion is man's search for the beautiful. It is a search for that power of God which causes rejoicing. And in this, there is a point that perhaps represents one of the reasons for a conflict between Plotinus and the early church. Plotinus could not conceive of a religion of fear. He could not conceive of men being good because they were afraid to be bad. He could not conceive of a universe in which a principle of sin uh, could gain even passing dominion over good. Nor could he conceive of worship as a sadness, as a sorrowing, as a continuous offering up of weaknesses and failings and shortcomings.
shortcomings. He could not think of men born in sin and conceived in iniquity. There was no part of that in his way of life. He could not think of millions of human beings praying to be forgiven or all the strange doubts that infest the dead deathbeds of the conscience laden. To Plotinus, religion was a gracious, glorious motion, a worship of the eternal beauty by simply being beautiful. Not outwardly, but inwardly. Not in body alone, though this need not be neglected. But in so living that the inward life was radiant with grace, with charm, uh, with thoughtfulness and gentleness, with kindliness and consideration, and most perhaps of all with a great joy. For as he tells us, it is with joy that the soul comes forth to embrace the beautiful. We do not go timidly and miserably to give our hearts to those whom we love in this world. Young lovers do not go in tears and mourning to each other. Nor should man's soul, the eternal child of the eternal, fear to go radiantly home to its father. Therefore, in this concept of Plotinus, all things grow graciously, beautifully, and beauty is therefore an endless rejoicing in the doing of those things which are true and beautiful. In this, then, we see the philosophy of beauty spreading itself over many departments and ways of life. And finally, because of his own mystical apperceptions and because of the amazing beauty and sensitiveness of his own soul, Plotinus begins to contemplate the nature of God as beauty. It is not in this essay, but it is in other works of his. And he begins to think of God no longer as a great ordaining power. He is no longer thinking of God as power. He is no longer thinking of God as law. He is rather thinking of God as love. And he is assuming that there can be no beauty in the relationships of creatures to each other or to their creator except through that beauty which is love. Love, therefore, rejoices in the service of the beloved. Love gives of itself and finds its fullness. Love moves always graciously and with gentleness of spirit and finds in these uh, gentle fulfillments, a strange over artistry that is the sovereign beauty of creation. So in Plotinus, the contemplation upon the infinite as love reveals essentially that to know God is to love God. And in knowing God, the first grand vision that we have of the eternal shape or substance is an incredible blaze of ineffable beauty beyond definition, beyond description. And that this beauty, therefore, brings with it a sense of security. Man is not afraid of the beautiful. He is hardly aware of his own instinct as he rushes forth to it. He loves it because it is beautiful. And he learns to love God because God is beautiful. And love the world because the world is beautiful. And to love the soul of his neighbor because in spite of the darkness which obscures the body, within is the radiant prismatic soul forever beautiful. And in the discovery of beauty in himself, man discovers the beauty in others and can no longer have an enemy. In discovering the beauty in himself, man gains an incredible patience because he sees how difficult it is when he disciplines his own nature to release and redeem this subtle quality of beauty within himself. Therefore, he is no, he no longer wonders why others are not better. He knows that in their hearts they are growing. 
and that this same beauty that sustains him will flow through them and bring them to the fullness of their own purposes. So prejudice ceases, conceits cease, worldliness ceases, because where man's treasure is, there his heart is. And when his treasure is in ineffable beauty, there also his heart and his mind are united. So out of the life of beauty comes a great discipline of theology and mysticism. A mysticism that appeals to the sensitive, emotional quotient of the soul. The mind seeks for the beautiful, the heart finds it. And the heart and mind in this partnership serve a wonderful purpose. For what the mind discovers, the heart experiences. And through these minglings of their purposes, again a unity is formed from diversity. And a heart-mind power united gains the singleness of I, which can see the beauty of unity. So Plotinus says, as man brings his own nature into a unity, he is capable of perceiving unity, which is true beauty. As long as there are two faculties in his own mind, there will be two factions in his world. As long as he himself thinks of nine parts of his own character, he will find nine men outside of himself. He will find nine kinds of life if he lives nine kinds of life. But when in himself he lives but one kind of life, he will then find in the world only one kind, because he has discovered it. And when man, through his growth, has gradually overcome all difference and division, until finally he can find and establish a one life in himself, in that instant, the universe blazes forth the mystery of one life. And only the one who has brought his own parts into a greater unity can ever experience God, the supreme unity. Because the things that man and God have most in common is the union in themselves. Thus, any being which achieves the complete possession of its own parts and organizes them into a purpose pattern, by that unity, partakes of all unity existing in time and space. This unity, again, is another name for sovereign beauty, and so the story goes. Out of it then comes worship, a most simple meditation, a purifying of life, and the simple summary of all of the Plotinus uh, disciplines, namely, that man approaches truth achieves peace, attains eternal security by restoring the oneness in himself, and that in this restoration his most wonderful and acceptable and useful instrument is his appreciation for beauty, for wherever it is, it is a little living thing, growing perhaps in the shadow of the dead, wherever the green branch of beauty is to be found within man, there is life. And while that life remains, it can grow and achieve its own immortality. Man's love of beauty is the final proof, therefore, of his possible attainment of all good things. And that he has beauty in himself decrees his ultimate identity with deity, the supreme and complete power of beauty in the universe. Well, the time is up.